26-13 after a field goal. Reggie Barlow outside. And just when you think it's safe, it's not. He could go all the way. 92 yards, 26 to 20. Two teams that you might pick for the Super Bowl, the AFC, the Chiefs, and the Jaguars. But factor in the Jaguars specialties because on his own 15, Reggie Barlow fields a putt, and he could go all the way. 85 yards to the chagrin of Marty Schottenheimer. 7 0 Jaguars. Reggie Barlow. Rio for our next guest, uh, Reggie Barlow, his alma mater, Alabama State, uh, the Hornets. He had a career of 133 catches, 2,536 yards. His senior year, 58 catch- catches, 1,267 uh, yards. Uh, he was drafted in the fourth round by the Jacksonville Jags, played eight years in the league, 82 games overall, eight playoff games, made the postseason four years, played with uh, the Jacksonville Jags 96 to 2000 for five years, and then won a Super Bowl with the Tampa Bay Bucks in 02 played for the Bucks as well in 03. You just heard uh, the touchdown pass he caught from Brad Johnson uh, in that season in a wild game on Monday Night Football against the Indianapolis Colts where I believe they had a 21-0 lead in that game did the Bucks and Manning and the uh, Colts come back to win that game uh, 38-35 to in a shootout. Uh, he was a wide receiver but he was a great punt and kick uh, returner as well. Uh, in his career he had 39 catches, 520 two yards. That's an average of 13.2 per catch and a touchdown. As far as kickoff returns, 80 kickoff returns, 1,855 yards. That's an average of 23.2 in a return with a touchdown and punt returns. 158 punt returns. That's 80th all-time in the NFL. 1,639 punt return yards. That's 62nd uh, all-time. Uh, his average of 10.4 punt return yards is good for 46 all-time in the NFL. And two punt returns, uh, 93rd all time in the postseason, he had uh, 12 kickoff returns for 360, an average of 30 per kickoff return, along of 88. You just heard that one in the highlight reel. That was that that uh, uh, that tough loss for the Jags against the Jets in the playoffs. I want to talk to Reggie about that. And then 17 punts, 132 uh, yards coming back, an average of 7.8 along of 24. Let's bring him on. Uh, he was a, a Pro Bowl reserve as well. Well, had a phenomenal career uh, with the Jacksonville Jags, and there's a couple local connections with Reggie that he may not be aware of, but he might be aware of. Uh, we'll ask him about that. Uh, let's bring him on. He is also a standout coach now at Virginia State. He led his alma mater to a very successful run when he was there, 49-42, and 38-28 in league play. He's second all-time at his alma mater in wins. He's been at Virginia State now 
since 2016, 31 and 10, 22 and 6 in conference play. So that's a coaching record of 80 and 52. And he certainly played for some good coaches. And we want to see if any of, of that rubbed off on him. Uh, Reggie, coach, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. No problem at all. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so, Reggie, um, how are you doing? First, of, first and foremost, where are you located, and how are you and your family doing? Yeah, so uh, I'm actually uh, I'm in Petersburg, Virginia, right now. I've been back and forward to uh, Montgomery, Alabama, which is my hometown. Uh, still have a home there, and uh, so we kind of just been back and forward, just. Checking on the plays here, then going back to Montgomery for a little bit, but uh, for the most part in Virginia. So it's got to be a weird time for you, right? Because you're a football guy, you're a football coach, uh, you got a very successful program going. Right now, coach, uh, you'd be grinding in, in training camp, getting ready for a, probably a game that's less than a month away. Uh, you're not. D2, D3 shut down. Now the big power fives are starting to shut down in D1 for football. Uh, what is it like? Is it, a, is it a weird feeling, an anxious feeling, uh, almost a... Um, a restful feeling that you don't have to deal with trying to play through this COVID and all the procedures and uh, health concerns? Well, uh, I must admit, I mean, at, at first it was, um, you know, obviously a, a, a uncomfortable feeling because we're, we're creatures of habit mm-hmm. and we, we are consistently doing things a certain way around the time of year that it is, you know, like right. you mentioned, Right now, we would be uh, in training camp, so it's obviously extremely different. Uh, we uh, have been preaching and teaching not to fall in the loopholes of corona and you know, kind of have you a, a routine that you still do uh, that will uh, keep you fresh mentally, uh, give yourself the opportunity to get out and get some vitamin D and keep yourself healthy uh, physically as well. Uh, so, Coach, uh, and you know, I great follow on Twitter, uh, and you you made some good points on Twitter. You know, you don't you didn't go to a Power Five school. You went to all you know Alabama State. You had a great career. You got drafted by Tom Coughlin and the Jacksonville Jags. I don't know if you're you're aware, uh, but Tom Coughlin actually from Waterloo, New York, which is right up the road from us. So we obviously have followed Tom's career uh, very closely with the Jags, Boston College, Syracuse, the New York Giants. Of course, a two time now. Now, uh, Super Bowl champion coach Tom Coughlin and you got there in their second year of existence after a, a pretty poor first year four wins uh, but between 96 and 99 Reggie you guys were extremely good I know you know people like Tanner who's 20 my son they don't really remember that but you guys had some really good teams talk to me about playing for coach Coughlin and, and those Jag teams yeah, I'm so grateful for Coach Tom Coughlin for giving me an opportunity uh, drafting a guy from HBCU. And um, uh, obviously he had signed other guys from HBCUs that went on to have really good careers there in Jacksonville. But uh, Coach was a, a structured, organized, detailed guy. <laughs> um, he brought uh, a present. Um, he was a great communicator. Uh, there was no wavering of the rules with him, no matter who he were. Uh, so, uh, you know, he, he, he had the respect of our team. And you know, for, for guys going through the experience at that time, it, some of the stuff may rub you the wrong way, but you're just so grateful that you had an opportunity to be coached by a guy like that. Uh, such great knowledge, a uh, great passion for the game. He's a true bona fide winner. He's done it on every level. And uh, it was a blessing to play for him and, Obviously, the assistant coaches that we had there, Pete Carmichael was our receiver coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of those coaches had come from Boston College with him, so uh, they set the presence, and uh, we were able to get some good players in there. And uh, before you know it, we were running <laughs> off fourteen and two records yeah. and stuff like that, which is uh, pretty good. Uh, yeah, just real quickly, I want to touch on a couple big games throughout those years, but just uh, overall, I want to just get kind of get people a perspective. So overall, between 96 and 99, you guys were 45 and 19, 
thirty and five at home. Now, when you add in two thousand, you guys were seven and nine, fifty two and twenty eight, thirty three and nine at home in the AFC Central because you guys were in the Central at that time with Houston, then Tennessee, uh, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, Cincinnati, uh, and then Cleveland. Twenty five and nine in league play in the division from ninety six to ninety nine. Uh, five and five in two thousand puts you at thirty and fourteen overall. Uh, you were fourteen and three at home in divisional games, 96 to 99, overall 17 and 5. Reggie, when I throw out that division to you and we broke it down, we wanted to see how well you guys did per team. Uh, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Houston, Tennessee, Baltimore or Cleveland. Who do you think you guys had the most wins against between 96 and 2000 out of those teams? I would probably say Baltimore, right? Uh, Um, Yeah, you're right. 8 and 2 and you guys guys (laughs) went... 8-0 8-0 and, oh, and lost twice in 2000. So you guys uh, had uh, really <laughs> taken them to the woodshed. Then it was Cincinnati, 7-3. and three. Pittsburgh, 6-4. Right. and four. Uh, Cleveland, 4-0. and oh. And then Tennessee, Houston, as you know, uh, they were bugaboos for you. You guys were 5-5 five and five, uh, against those. So you guys had some good teams. Let's start out with... Um, the 96 uh, team, you guys go 9-7. and seven. Now, again, a little something here with us. You guys come to Buffalo. You beat the Bills 30-27 to 27 in that game. You lose in the AFC title game 20-6 to six to the New England uh, Patriots at Foxborough. Uh, you'd lost to them earlier in the year in overtime, 28-25. to 25. Any memories of that 96 AFC title game for you, Reggie? Yeah, but before we talk 96 uh playoff game, you, mm-hmm. you, we have to go back to how we got in. And it was a, a missed field goal by uh, uh, we were playing the Atlanta Falcons. We win the game, we're in. Of course, we lose, we're out. Right. Uh, and I think Morton Anderson missed the field goal there at the end. And um, we were able to get in and, you know, got in and like you, like you mentioned in Buffalo and I think Denver went and played. But the, uh, the thing I remember about the uh, AFC Championship game uh, New England was it was extremely cold and you're talking about a team coming from Jacksonville, Florida, where it was probably about 70 degrees or 80 degrees when we left, but um, it was extremely cold. But I remember our trainers and managers doing a really good job of having all the right gear. You know, we had the right. earmuffs inside our helmet, uh, you know, just to cover those holes there up. But uh, it was a, it was a hard fought game. Um, I remember the power going out. <laughs> for a little while, <laughs> a little mystique there. So we kind of we were rolling a little bit, and power goes out. But um, it was a it was a good battle. It was a good game. Obviously, they went on and uh, kind of did their thing after that. But uh, it was a great game to be a part of. Uh, we just uh, you know obviously didn't make enough yep. plays that game, but uh, was a, a really good season for us. The way that we. Uh, you know, second year being in the league and then making it to the AFC championship right. game. So it was, it was pretty cool. So you guys take a step forward in 97. You're 11 and 5. Your offense is third in the league in points per game. Uh, here's another Buffalo connection. So you come to Buffalo the second uh, to last week of the season. You beat the Bills 20 to 14. That is Marv Levy's last home game he ever coached. They go 6 and 10 that year. Uh, so that was Marv's last. Last game, you lose in the wild card, forty-two to seventeen against the Broncos. They go on to win uh, the Super Bowl, ninety-eight. Again, you go eleven and five. Week six, you come to Buffalo undefeated. Now, uh, I don't know what this says about Buffalo franchise, but this game that I'm about ready to talk about, we had the the guy, the star of the game, on, and this I would say is probably in the franchises. I wouldn't say top 20 or 25 games of all time, but certainly top 40, if not top 30. You guys are undefeated, Reggie. In 98, you come up to Ralph Wilson Stadium, and there's this little guy running around, number seven, Doug Flutie, and he brings his miracle across the uh, the border or from BC, and they score at the end of the game 17 to 16 for Buffalo to win that game. Do you remember that game at all? I, I remember um, the, the part I do remember is Doug Flutie coming in and Rob Johnson, who was our former teammate, yep. was there yep. um, with, you know, they're in 
competition for the quarterback <laughs> position. So it was extremely weird to like, okay, who do we want to see? We know Rob and we faced him a bunch. <laughs> or Flutie, well, we know he's going to run around. He's a playmaker. <laughs> he's going to keep plays alive. And I mean, he just, he, he just don't go away. I mean, he's an amazing, amazing competitor. And um, the, the excitement that he brought to Buffalo um, when he came, uh, was 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 something really special to see, but I do remember him coming in and obviously sparking that team yep. and uh, giving them an opportunity to to be victorious over us. And like you said, that that's what Doug Flutie counts on, right? People kind of just discounting him and not thinking he can do it. He loves proving people wrong. So you guys get revenge on New England. You beat them in the wild card, twenty five to ten that year. Uh, then you lose, as I talked about, that Jets game, thirty four to twenty four. And a lot of people believe you guys were the better team uh, that year. Mark didn't have his greatest game. I think he may have had three picks. You're talking about again playing New York. We went back, we looked. I think it was twenty eight degrees. Uh, you had an eighty eight yard kickoff return got pushed out I think at about the four yard line so Parcells beat you in the AFC championship game with New England in 96 him and Belichick again uh, in New York knock you off in that wild card game 34 to 24 Curtin Martis and and Vinny and the Jets and all that uh, they lose in the AFC title game to the Broncos who then again go on to win do you remember that uh, that game against the Jets because again a lot of people I think the Jets might have been favored by nine but I think if that game's in Jacksonville again that's probably a whole different game yeah I mean obviously playing um uh, playing the Jets and playing in a stadium, uh, what was it, Metal? Yep, Meadowlands. Yep. Meadowlands. Yep. Uh, are you talking about the win in that stadium is different than any other stadium that I've played in, especially being a punt returner, kick returner. Right. And I do remember the the first few kickoffs, um, Tavian Banks was back there with us uh, as a kick returner and was having some issues filling it uh, because of the win. And um, they switched us over and uh, that's when I was able to get the the 88 yard uh, kickoff return. Should have scored on it, uh, but after dodging four or five guys and then trying to outrun the rest of the guys, it was uh, it became a challenge. But I do remember this: uh, that team that that team was pretty solid. Curtis Martin yes. was yep. a beast. Yep. Uh, Keyshawn Johnson. Yep. Um, they had some they had some pretty good defensive players. I yes. think. Um, Man, the the, the long time uh, defensive player Cox that played yes, for Brian. Uh, yep, Brian Cox. Yeah, yep. so yeah, so they they had a team. I mean, <laughs> they, they, they were they were they were a t- they were a parcel team. I mean, they, <laughs> they played were. great defense and uh, going to score you know, enough points yep. to beat you. But um, it was a it was a really good game, and uh, unfortunately, we came up a little bit short. But uh, you mentioned Belichick, and you mentioned. Yep. Um, Parcells and you know Tom Coughlin. I mean, he, he coached with those guys, yep. so it's 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 uh, kind of similar systems and similar mindset, and uh, it's it's amazing how well all three of those yeah. coaches. Uh, have done no uh, doubt in the NFL, it. and and he, they probably got the best of him um, when they were in New England in in with the Jets. Uh, but uh, as we mentioned, he uh, he did get some revenge with the uh, Giants, knocking off a undefeated uh, Patriots team in one Super Bowl and beating them in the next. So I want to talk about just real quickly, and then we're going to jump to your coaching career. Ninety nine. But let me just ask you this, Reggie. We talk about the cold and stuff. When you're running back a, a punt or a kick like that, eighty eight yards. Because I do some 5Ks and I've ran a half marathon, but I, yeah, certainly nothing like you. Uh, so, you know, I'm, we're in the western New York, so it's cold almost 10 months out of the year around here. Is it harder to run a, a kickoff or a punt return back in the heat where you're sweating or in the cold where it's burning your lungs like that in New York in 28 degree weather? It's, it's, uh, it's tougher in the, in, the, in the north yeah, where it's cold. I mean, and, and then, I mean, the eighty yard, the eighty eight yard kick that I had. I mean, it. I mean, it took all of me to, to you know. And then hitting the ground, the right. cold ground, was probably the worst part of it. So, uh, but yeah, it's it's definitely hard because now you got the wind that yep. you you, you got to work with to catch the ball to receive the ball, mm-hmm. and then of course, um, you know, just trying to dodge guys and stuff in the cold. And and at that time. Mm-hmm. We were on the old turf. 
All right. We hadn't, yes. quite, we hadn't quite made it to uh, the, the, the sports yes. So that makes it extremely different as well. So. Yeah, that, that that was cement with a little bit of a rug over it, essentially, was, uh, was that turf. <laughs> so, right, right. So, so 99, you guys are, are maybe your best team, at least record-wise. You're 14-2. and two. Uh, You're sixth in the league in scoring now, uh, just shy of 25 uh, points. Your defense is number one. So that's really what has come along with this 99 team. Uh, the defense was number one in points per game, only giving up 12 points per game. Uh, and now you guys not only were a career killer in 90, uh, 97, where you ended Marv Levy's career in, in, in Buffalo, and also Todd Collins, uh, not that many Buffalo people remember that or care. He went out to play in Washington. But you might know this, Reggie. So 99, you guys molly Wop, the Miami Dolphins in the division round, 62-7. to seven. It is the last, Dan Marino. last game Dan Marino ever plays, and it's the last game Jimmy Johnson ever coaches, and it's the second most points ever scored in a postseason game. The only other one, and I don't even know if you can count it, 1940, the Chicago Bears put up 72 against the Washington Redskins. So uh, you guys were on fire in that game. You lose to Tennessee in the title game, 33-14. to You had lost to them twice during the year, 20-19, to and 41-20. to Talk to me about that game, because quite frankly, all of your losses – came to Tennessee that year. Outside of them, you guys um, could have taken that number one defense against the greatest show on turf in the Super Bowl. Man, that would have been fun. I can say um, only giving up 12 points a game is just, uh, I don't know where that ranks in the NFL, but that is that is playing some defense right yes. there, my man. But, uh, uh, but that, I mean, that, that game was the loudest and the most electric <laughs> Uh, feeling that I had mm-hmm. in my career in Jacksonville. Fred Taylor had some explosive runs, probably one of the best runs I've seen by a running back mm-hmm. uh, in that game. You can go back and watch it. It was yeah. a, an amazing run. Then he outran everybody and you know rushed for a lot of yards. Jimmy Smith, as usual, Keenan McCardell, yep. those guys that big game. Uh, our offensive line, Mark Brunel, um, you know, did, did his thing. And, I mean, we were even able to play – uh, you know, our backup guys and stuff, but it was a, it was a, it was a really, really good game. Very electric yeah. atmosphere, and uh, just, and I didn't know that. That I, I didn't know it was uh, Coach Johnson's last game, but I did know it was Dan Marino's yeah. last <laughs> yeah. game. So uh, you guys, we're sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> we love, we we love Dan Marino. That's you know? right. You guys were certainly career killers, 96 to 99. There's no doubt about it. You uh, you helped a lot of people retire. So you guys come up short. Um, but and you mentioned there was a lot of great guys on that team. Fred Taylor was a great running back. Jimmy Smith, uh, Keenan McCardell, great wide receivers. I think because in, they're in Jacksonville, just like in Buffalo, that's a medium to small market when you talk about the NFL. So I don't think those guys probably got the attention. I don't think that defense gets the attention. You know, you hear about the 02 Bucks team, uh, the 2000 Ravens defense, uh, the 85 Bears. That Jags um, 99 defense flies under the radar again because I think it was it was in Jacksonville. You could have been on the field more, number 84, Reggie Barlow, but you were behind two good wide receivers, Keenan and Jimmy. Talk to me about that wide receiver crew. Man, let me tell you, those are my big brothers. Uh, I'm so thankful for them. They, they, they taught me how to be a pro. Uh, we're still keeping contact right now. Uh, Jimmy is another HBCU guy. Played at Jackson State. Mm-hmm. Keenan McCardell was smooth. He had great routes. He could catch. He could, you know, he could run. Uh, just a very diversified, uh, diver- uh, diverse player. Mm-hmm. Uh, both of those guys, I mean, they didn't go to the pro the Pro Bowl the same year, but it was almost like Jimmy would go <laughs> right. one year, Keenan would go the next year, right. Jimmy would go two years, and then <laughs> Keenan go. So they were just uh, they were some outstanding uh, wide receivers, and uh, they did a good job. And they they really don't. We're hoping that Jimmy at some point uh, get in the uh, in the Hall of Fame. If you look at his numbers, yep, uh, he's up there. He's up there with a lot of guys. Sure. And then of course Keenan is. Uh, coaching now and doing his thing, but yep. he was an amazing football player, and uh, I'm I'm just so thankful and grateful for uh, those guys. Willie Jackson was another guy that yep. was there, and I, uh, Al was with it. Yep. Uh, so uh, just a just an amazing team that we had together. But you know, as you mentioned, uh, on our defense, we had 
Brackens and Kevin Hardy and a, a bunch of guys that had just come in the league around the time I did. But uh, uh, just a solid, solid team that Coach Coughlin and his group have put together. And no doubt about it. And again, when you look at Jimmy and, and Keenan's numbers, they may not necessarily look the same as a wide receiver's today, but it's just such a different game. Again, Coughlin, you know, he was, I wouldn't, I don't want to say he was totally conservative, but Coughlin liked to run the football a lot, and the league just wasn't quite as pass heavy. So if you weighted the numbers, certainly Jimmy and Keenan uh, putting up numbers like guys today, they just didn't throw the ball quite as much back then. Tanner, why don't you go ahead and jump in here and ask Coach uh, Reggie Barlow your first question. So in the NFL, you played with some Pro Bowl quarterbacks like uh, Mark Brunel, Brad Johnson. If it wasn't one of those guys, who threw the hardest ball that you uh, caught passes from in your career? Oh, man. I, we played with this guy named Jonathan Quinn, okay. uh, the Jaguars. We drafted him in, I want to say the third round or something. I mean, this guy had a missile. <laughs> <laughs> you did not want to go with him when it's time to like, do individual routes and stuff. It was like, hey, John, can you please take something off, brother? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, a, That's right. it's a hitch route. It's a hitch route. But, uh, That's right. but yeah, he, he, had, he, he had a can. Uh, John, uh, Jonathan Quinn is mad, I think. He played with the Jaguars for a few years, and mm-hmm. then I think he went to the Chicago Bears or something like yep. that. But he, he probably throwed it the hardest. Re- Reggie, let me ask you this, because there's not many of them out there. You think of Brunel, you think of Steve Young, maybe Scott Mitchell, and then Jared Lorenzen. But after that, I, I, I start to have a hard time coming up with lefties. Is it different, the spin and having to catch a ball from a left-handed quarterback? Yeah, it is extremely different. Um you know, that ball hits the, 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 the center of your hands a different way. Um, I think um, for guys that, that most of my college career, I played with right-handed quarterbacks. And then when I got in the NFL, you know, getting used to consistently catching from a lefty, it is a different spin. Yep. Uh, Mark had a great arm. He could throw it. Uh, he could make all the throws. And uh, when you got a guy like that that can make all the throws, it does make it a little bit simpler to catch those balls, though. Uh, so then you go to another great franchise right down the road, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, world champions in 2002. I can't believe it, Reggie. Uh, we're coming on almost 20 years it's going to be here in a year or two. Man, how time uh, flies uh, that that has happened. So you play with John Gruden uh, a gr- you know, for 2 3 Great coaching staff. Uh, you're talking Raheem Morris, Mike Tomlin, mm-hmm. Jay Gruden, Rob Marinelli. I mean, that was just a ton of great coaches that are still in the league. Uh, Jeremy Bates, guys like that that were on that staff. Again, a lot of people give that 2 defense a lot of credit and say that it's one of the great greatest of all time. Uh, talk to me about your time with John Gruden in the box. Yeah, so uh, Gruden is, I mean, he's one of my favorite coaches of all time. Great guy. Uh, genuine enthusiasm. Coaches with a lot of passion and energy. Uh, extremely knowledgeable of the game. And uh, I thought he did a really good job of coming in and managing that team who had <laughs> played for a extreme be- – for a beloved coach. Yes. And, you know, sometimes that could go the other way when you got a new guy come in. Their personalities mm-hmm. are extremely different. Yep. But I commend uh, him on how he managed the team. Then I also commend our leaders. Commend yes. our leaders, Derek Brooks, John Lynch, Rondé Barber, um, Warren Sapp. Uh, those guys were, you know, good teams. What I've learned, good teams. Mm-hmm. The coach doesn't have to manage the discipline and all that stuff. Those guys. Right. Uh, managed that in the in the locker room and stuff. So uh, I had an opportunity to play for John Gruden when I was with the Raiders for a year okay. when he was there, and that's how I ended up. Oh, all right, yeah, in Tampa. Sure. Um, but um, but uh, he did a good job right. of managing that team and, right. and and allowing those guys to have that same personality that they had an identity right. uh, under Coach Dungy from a defensive standpoint. Yeah. So I thought that was really good. Uh, no doubt about it. So you were with John in the uh, infamous Tuck game then, because I think that was a one was uh, the Patriots uh, and uh, the Raiders. And obviously the Pats won that game on the Tuck rule. They get to keep the ball. Vinatieri kicks it and they go to the Super Bowl. So as you mentioned, you know, sometimes a great coach has to be just someone who can, you know, manage a team. You know, you got Warren Sapp, you got Keyshawn. Those guys don't mind, you know, uh, giving their opinions <laughs> in the paper and giving their thoughts. So you you got to handle those guys a certain way. And I thought John did a, a great 
job of that. We see him on Hard Knocks, and, and you know, again, Tanner grew up watching John on TV, right? In in, in the booth. Right. Yeah, come on, man. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? You know, he's like this. He's this character, yeah. and he's funny. Was he like that? Is is a coach or did he turn a little bit more like that once he got into the media eye and on TV? No, that's exactly who he was as a coach. Hey guys, take a look at this now. We're going to line these guys up and if you notice the defense, they're in a 2 D contour and we're going to, you know. Right. So yeah, he was that's, that's, that's just who he is. Yeah. He can't change. Yeah. He can't change, but uh, he's a great coach, a good, good friend and um you know, I, I really believe that he's going to have the Raiders rolling, yep. um, you know, uh, this season and, and, and the rest of the way. Uh, you know, I talked to a couple former Bucks, and I think it's unfortunate. Again, uh, that de- that defense was pretty good. I think they only gave up 13 and change per game. But because of, the, at first, this narrative of, okay, John came from Oakland. He knew the play calls. He knew all the plays. He knew what, you know, Rich was going to do, Gannon. Uh, he knew what Bill Callahan was going to call. At first, it was like, haha, they, they knew what they were going to run beforehand. But now that the Raiders have hammered that home for almost 20 years, now it's like, well, geez, if John didn't know every play they were going to run, maybe it would have been a different game. And I think it takes away from how good that Bucks team and defense was. And on the other hand, you can say, well, but that's not John's fault. Uh, and again, two weeks is, is not a lot of time to install a new playbook. But if you know John is familiar with your offense, Reggie, as a coach now, it's incumbent in, in on you to try to change things up so that the Bucks defense doesn't know exactly the play you, you're going to run when you call out uh, you know, the play call. Well, I agree. And uh, I remember the Super Bowl week at practice. Coach Gruden ran the scout team a few times. Right. I mean, he was doing all the mannerisms of Rich, <laughs> Jet, Rich Gannon right. calling out signals and plays and getting us lined up. And I mean, he did it, yep. you know, for a, a few uh, a series there uh, to really mimic and give our defense everything that they uh, would, would would see. And that's yep. coaching. I yep. mean, um, that's uh, uh, kudos to him for doing that. And. Our defense, man, they just played lights out. I mean, it was interception after interception. There were sacks. There was, I mean, it was, it was an explosive defense uh, 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 game that 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 day. And uh, our guys did a really good job. No doubt about it. Tanner, jump in here and go ahead and ask Coach Reggie Barlow, uh, world uh, champion. Your next question. Since becoming a coach, you've worked with some NFL talent like Isaiah Crowell, a running back in the NFL. You worked with at Alabama State. But one guy that stuck out to me that you worked with is Tavares Jackson. He spent some time with Minnesota, Seattle, and a year with the Bills right here in our backyard. You were his quarterback's coach in 05 at Alabama State. He threw for 2,655 yards that year, 25 touchdowns, only five picks, completed 61% of his passes. He was drafted with the last pick in the second second round by the Vikings in 06. Unfortunately, tragically no longer with us, lost his light this past April. Tell us a little bit about T-Jack and the time you spent working with him. Yeah, so T-Jack, our relationship goes way back. He and I grew up in the same neighborhood, Ridgecrest uh, in Montgomery, Alabama. We went to the same middle school, Bellingraph. We went to the same high school, <laughs> uh, Lanier High School. And then, of course, he went to Arkansas and then came back to Alabama State, which is the same school I went to. And Tavares had all of the skill set. He could make all the throws. He was an extremely smart guy. Uh, He understood the position. So me coming in as a receiver and coaching him as a quarterback, the things that I wanted to help him with was the thought process of the game, not getting too emotional, uh, if you make a bad throw or a throw or interception, it was the, the, the small detail things that we were able to help him out with. Uh, obviously, he took coaching well. Uh, he had a solid year that year, ended up getting drafted, started in the NFL. But outside of me being his coach, we later became buddies. You know, he became mm-hmm. like my, my buddy, and I became a mentor to him. And we spent a bunch of time together talking football and, um, you know, spent a bunch of time just, just hanging out and talking about his playbook that he was doing and all that stuff. So he was extremely passionate uh, about football and being a good coach. You know, that's what he wanted to do is to be a good coach. He's obviously a good dad, a good husband. Uh, he is our quarterback uh, in Montgomery, and we've had 
uh, a lot. Now, I, I, I tell people about us going to Lanier because our high school has, I think, six Super Bowl champions that went to our high school. Wow. Which is probably, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so Sydney Lanier High School. Yeah. It's uh, Bart Starr went to that high oh, school. Oh, So wow. that tells you uh, that we've had Damn. some talent sure. to come through there. But we miss Tavares. He's an amazing guy. And uh, obviously, uh, we'll continue to uplift him and, and his family and everything that we do. Uh, just a, a real couple uh, quick questions, and then we'll cut you loose. So we talked about going from warm to cold. So the Bucks in 2 go up to Philly and win on a very cold night in the NFC Championship game uh, to be able to get to that Super Bowl and, and stop Andy Reid uh, from getting to that Super Bowl he was trying to get to uh, so bad in Philadelphia. Is it easier now? You obviously you can speak going warm to cold because you played in Tampa and Jacksonville and in Oakland. Do you think it's harder for you guys? Because we see this on TV and it's a storyline when a warm weather team or a dome team comes to a, an open, uh, cold uh, stadium or team. Is it harder to go from hot to cold? Or we've seen the Bills, the Patriots, the Steelers have difficult times going down south they stumble with the bucks they stumble with the jags they stumble with the dolphins especially in the middle of the winter because they're used to it being so cold do you think it's harder for you guys to go to the cold or those guys from the northeast in the winter to come down to the heat and humidity of florida yeah i think it's harder to come down uh from from up north to the south because i mean that heat sucks yeah. i mean it <laughs> sucks all of your energy out of you and i've seen guys from the Bengals, the Steelers, yeah. different teams literally puking right. during the game because it was it, it, in, in Jacksonville, yeah. the, the humidity and all that stuff. So uh, I know it was a challenge for them, and I, I would say it's harder to go uh, from up north um, out uh, down south to play. Uh, is it harder to go – Hot to cold, or we hear about this all the time, going left coast to right coast. There's stats on how teams from the left coast struggle going to the right coast. Would you rather go to a cold weather place or have to take a four or five hour airplane trip to the west coast? Yeah, send me to the west coast. That cold, is, <laughs> <laughs> that cold man. The helmets, the helmets feel a little bit different in right. the cold when yep. you're getting tackled. So, uh, uh, but yeah, and that's just me. Um, I, I think. You know, obviously, it's mentally you have to find a way to get past all of it. Right. Uh, you know, as mentioned, your trainers and managers, they do a good job of making sure you have the stuff that you need. But um, I, I just, you know, prefer uh, planning and, 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 and warmer weather mm -hmm. than cold weather. Uh, so, uh, you know, Reggie, um, you played for, obviously, two, you know, great coaches. You're a coach now. Uh, we talk about, you know, John Gruden, and we saw him on, you know, Hard Knocks, Knock on Wood, if you're with me, and all that. And, you know, people were criticizing him a little bit because he was mentioning, you know, things like the Blue Bonnet Bowl and stuff like that. Stuff that, you know, today's guys in their 20s, I know what the Blue Bonnet Bowl is, but uh, somebody in their early 20s, probably not going to know that. You know, John was referencing guys that maybe they wouldn't remember you're a young guy, you know, you're not even 50 yet. You're, you're coaching young guys at the college level. It, it, what's the fine line between trying to be, you know, hip, but not be their friend, you know, Belichick, you know, his famous joke is I'm not on, you know, snap face and stuff like that. He doesn't try to be <laughs> hip and happening. You know, he doesn't try to be their friend. Uh, and as he gets older, obviously that distance between him and those rookies and those guys coming onto the team, keep getting wider and wider and wider. And uh, is it something you have to work at to make sure you're on Twitter and social media and you, you kind of know the slang and stuff like that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, obviously, you have to be able to adjust with the time. And I think, uh, as mentioned, Coach Gruden does a good job of that. I think he's in touch. And uh, he has his own uh, charisma on yeah. how he uh, presents to the team. And mm -hmm. then, of course, Belichick. I mean, he's Belichick. So <laughs> it's more or less you need to uh, conform to right. <laughs> you know, the standards that we've been having here. Yep. So, But for me as a coach, Yes, I'm. I, I'm on Twitter. I, I listen to the music that my guys listen to because, mm -hmm. well, in practice we we let them play. We let them play music during pre practice. Okay. So of course you you hear a lot of that sure. stuff and uh, the things that get them going, the mm -hmm. things that they like to hear or the things they like doing. You know, we try to be as engaging as possible without becoming someone else. Mm -hmm. And I think um, me 
um, my experience playing in a league and still being in in in, in intact in reality and not too far uh, removed from uh, playing and then being in college as a coach throughout the last 13, 15 years has allowed me to really stay in, uh, uh, you know, stay intact with, you know, the things that are going on and the things that these young men like and other things that get them going. Uh, and finally, I want to just circle back to Tom Coughlin. Uh, you know, it's a huge story, you know, when you when you hear all these stories about um – uh, you know, New York uh, with him with the Giants and, you know, the the veterans had to come to Tom and say, listen, you got to you got to relax just a little bit. You know, Tiki, uh, Strahan, you know, because he was very rigid. Uh, he was very strict. Um, and if you were on time to a meeting, you were five You're minutes late. late. Was that the same yeah. way he was in Jacksonville? Oh, yeah, he was that way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There's a few situations in Jacksonville that we all sit back and laugh about. Now I know we had a uh, we had to wear a shirt and tie on the plane, and then when we got to the hotel, you could wear shorts, uh, no open toe shoes, no boots, <laughs> no um, you know shirt tucked in, all that stuff. Wow! And I remember after one game getting a fine, and I'm like, man, I, I got fine, and then it had on there about a shirt I had on. I'm like, what? So I go down to talk with him, you know, because I had on this, and it was a nice polo button-down shirt. Right. And, uh, I mean, it met the criteria. And when I right. asked him why I get fined, he said, well, it looks like you were going to a picnic that you were going But he didn't like my shirt. So. <laughs> oh, man, that is, that is hard. I, now, do you, you might not be that tough, but have you implemented anything, you know, like that or from Gruden that you do, whether it be just in coaching or off the field with your players like that? So my coaching philosophy uh, is a result of three coaches. One, my college coach, Houston Markham. Mm -hmm. And Coach Markham was a grinder, worker, worker, worker. I mean, and when I say grinder, I'm talking about in terms of conditioning Mm -hmm. and just reps and reps and reps. Uh, So obviously we took that from him. We can't be as tough as he was, but that's the kind of mindset we try to create. And then, of course, with Coach Coughlin right. is the structure, sure. the organization. This is how we're going to do it. There will be no negotiation of the rules. Yep. Uh, we're going to hold you to the standards of the rule. We're going to attack a problem. You know, all those things. Mm-hmm. So we do that. And then with Coach Gruton is the genuine enthusiasm and energy and, you know, he, all of them were great communicators. But Gruton, I think, you know, he does a, an amazing job of engaging guys and keeping them engaged. Um, so I am a combination, and I'm so thankful yeah. for all three of those guys um, that my coaching uh, career and philosophy has really uh, evolved around uh, the things that I learned from those guys. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I, a great watch for anybody, if you're a Coughlin fan or a Jags fan or anything. Uh, 1998 Jacksonville Jaguars season highlights on YouTube. Uh, there's footage of Coughlin and you guys in training camp, and he's in a shirt and shorts and a cap, and he's giving it to guys, and he's uh, he's on everybody, and uh, uh, it was pretty funny. I was watching that uh, today, getting ready for it. And finally, the XFL tried this, so as a kickoff guy, I want want to get your thoughts. We talked to Steve Tasker uh, about the NFL tinkering with the kickoffs and a lot of touchbacks and for safety purposes, you know, maybe they get rid of it. Maybe you just get the ball on the 25, the 30 or the 35, but the XFL, you could not, the kicking team could not release until the returner caught the ball. Would you like that as a returner? Yeah, I thought it was pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, I, as I watched a few of the games that, that guys, uh, you know, that they played, I, I thought it was a, a interesting uh, concept. And then it, it takes away those guys running down right. um, 50 yards and hollering your mama name out right. and saying they're going right. to kill you. Right, <laughs> right. So now that's true. You shrink that down, <laughs> and now it's not the, it, it's not the impact uh, right. That you would have, so I, I think it's it's. I think it would bring excitement to the kickoff because now it's almost like it's either going to go out of the right. end zone yep. or you know they they may catch it and you know maybe get you know a few yards. But um, I, would, I I think that would be a, a cool little uh, change up to oh. see how it goes and yeah. uh, if it works. Then of course you can switch it up, sure. but it, it gives it gives the fan a little bit yes. more excitement of yep. okay, here's some more. 
you know, competition here. Uh, and finally, I would guess punts because you have less time. They get down there faster. What was more difficult? Because you guys are, you know, up looking at the ball, I guess, for the punts, not as much as kickoff. What was harder to do, kickoff or punt returns? Yeah, I'd say punt return. Every time I watch an old highlight of myself, I was like, how did I have the nerve to do anything like that? I mean, who who wants to look up in the air at a ball while these guys are running down trying to uh, shoot? I mean, why would you want to do that? Yeah, I, I give you um, credit for that, Reggie. <laughs> right, but we, 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 had some, we had some really good special team yeah. players, uh, Brett Boyer and Dave Thomas and early on Kevin Hart, even Fred Taylor played a little bit on special teams. But those guys did a good job of – you know, creating those lanes and stuff. But I would say being a punt returner uh, was certainly uh, uh, a little bit harder to catch and field and all that stuff than uh, being on a kickoff return. And again, no doubt about it, I don't know when it came into play, but I think people forget that they actually had to put a fair catch rule in. Back in the day, I don't even think there was a fair catch rule. So uh, you were just back there, and they were running 40, 50 yards, uh, you know, like missiles coming down at you. And I give you credit. It takes a lot of uh, nerve. Reggie, listen, continued success. Uh, oh, uh, my last question. Uh, we looked. You guys ha- had an incredible game against Virginia Union this year uh, with, with a crazy ending. Am I correct that you guys were in overtime? You were winning by three. Virginia Union lined up for a field goal that essentially looked like it was going to take you guys to double overtime, and they faked it. It didn't go well, but I guess you could give them, you know, everybody was calling them boneheads in a a horrible play call, but uh, you probably didn't expect them to fake it there, did you? Talk to me about the end of that game. Man, uh, you're talking about... Uh, if he if they convert that play, then it's oh my god, what a genius! <laughs> right? And Coach Barlow and Virginia State are some boneheads. They didn't cover this, but right. it's crazy that our ball boy, our ball boy, uh-huh. which is on both sides, mm-hmm. is is was on the sideline, and he noticed the guy standing there who they were going to try to throw the ball to. Ah alerted one of our DBs, but our DB was heading that way anyway. Okay. He was heading that way, right. but he got some extra help, I would say, yeah. from <laughs> a little the assist. ball boy saying, look, right here. Yeah. But yep. the guy catches the snap and just throws it <laughs> right. all the way to right. the track. Right. So, I mean, I, you know, but but I was glad yeah. to, to, man, I, I ran so fast <laughs> that night on the field because I just – you know, that's a big game for us sure. and our fans, and yep. uh, it was a fun game to yep. be a part of. And they do a good job over there with their, their team and coaching them up, yep. and uh, it'll always be a challenge. Yes. But uh, we were happy to yep. win that one in our yep. season of 8-2, and, two, and yep. um, you know, excited about that. Well, like you said, probably wasn't executed uh, the best. If it was, like you said, if that was executed, uh, you're probably on Sports Center's top plays, but for the wrong reason, like you said. <laughs> so, uh, uh, listen, Coach, continued success. I hope you guys can get together as a team uh, before we know it, and certainly I hope there's a season, uh, whether it be in the spring or next fall for you guys. I know you love it. I know you love coaching these guys. You're doing a great job with that program at Virginia State. Uh, congratulations on the great career. Uh, as I like to say, you know, uh, you were a grinder. Uh, you did. You you made the most uh, of every ounce of talent you had uh, to stay in the league for eight years like that. Uh, go to the playoffs, uh, AFC title game, Super Bowl. Uh, you certainly uh, maximized everything you had, and I think you're certainly an inspiration to uh, your players. There's no doubt about it. We appreciate you coming on. Continued success and health to you your family and team hey thanks for having me on man you guys are the most detailed and (laughs) fat that i've ever uh did in an interview and i I commend you guys tanner great job on the questions you asked and uh, i look forward to hearing uh, or listening to uh, you guys again all right thanks so much coach be well thanks please all righty, there you go. Reggie Barlow, and again, uh, you know, a grinder, uh, a jag, just another guy, um, but uh, he did everything uh, he had to and could to stay on the field, and there was another guy like that with Tampa Bay uh, I wanted to ask him about, but Carl the Truth Williams was another great returner. Now, again, if Carl, because that was kind of Carl's specialty, uh, was, you know, the returns, if Carl's not there, Reggie probably has a, a much more um, prominent role for the box. Um, 
but uh, both were great at kickoffs and punt returns. And so, uh, uh, but a great career to stay in the league for 82 games. Uh, stays in the league long enough, I believe, to to get the uh, to get the pension. I believe, which uh, certainly is well deserved um, for him and uh, anybody that can stay in the league long enough to uh, get that. So, uh, we appreciate Coach Barlow, and hopefully, they can uh, you know. Uh, they can get black playing football sooner than later. That is for sure. All right. Uh, we're late. 92-1 the team. We'll be back on the flip side.